once this is all done, you see this ash. There will be turkeys out in this almost immediately. There will be deer out in this almost immediately. When it comes to managing wildlife habitat, fire is commonly referred to as the single best tool in most areas of the country. In this episode, we hope to show you how safe and effective prescribed fire can be for your property. Today, Dr. Harper, along with Kip Adams from the NDA, discuss various practices and techniques on how to increase the quality of habitat for the wildlife on your property. The first discussion and demonstration we want to show you guys are based around the application of prescribed fires. Now I want to say right off the bat, I'm no expert when it comes to prescribed burns. This is a practice we've never tried here in PA, and my experience with them is very limited. With that said, I'm going to take a back seat in this episode and let the professionals explain this application and the benefits it can provide. Kip Adams from the National Deer Association. Prescribed fire is one of the best strategies that we can use to manage deer habitat. Prescribed fire is the planned and prescribed use of fire, just as its name implies. This is not wildfire. This is not just going to start in fires willy-nilly. This is actually planning where we want to use it and under the current conditions and the best optimal conditions to achieve what our objective is. The cool thing is we can use this to manage old fields, to either reduce leaf litter, to set back succession, to reduce encroachment of woody vegetation. We can use these in forested areas to remove that leaf litter, to reduce fuel loads, to increase herbaceous matter or high quality deer food underneath those forests. There's lots of different applications of fire. Fortunately, more people today can use this on a private landowner basis than before. This is a good thing. The use of fire that is prescribed, that is planned, and is executed by professionals and or experienced landowners can dramatically enhance wildlife habitat for deer, turkeys, and almost any other wildlife species that you're interested in. We could use low intensity fire in this situation right here, and I would strongly recommend that. And you would, of course, start the, the fire on the uphill side and more often than not, and of course you would check this on your burn day, you would have a breeze coming up the hill here. So you would be starting on the uphill side, on the, also on the downwind side. And you would have a fire break up there. You always, always start your fire on the downwind side, immediately adjacent to your fire break. And you monitor the fire behavior in a, in a small test fire to see how things are behaving. Of course, you have to consider the conditions during which you're burning. And so today, it's 79 degrees right now, and uh, the humidity is 61%. So another one of the things that we can use fire for, because Jerry is gonna plant a food plot here, and he's killed off the existing vegetation. Now, you could, of course, and we will cover this this afternoon, you could plant via no-till, or you can plant conventionally, where you work up a seed bed with a tillage or a disc or what have you, and then you plant into a prepared seed bed that way. And that is what they're gonna do. Now he could disc in this material, or you can simply burn it off, and then according to what you're planting, such as small seeded clovers, <clears throat> just top sow right on top of the burned area, and then call to pack to get good firm seed to soil contact, and that's perfectly good. Now, of course, I imagine all of you are aware this is a drip torch and we've got about 60% diesel, 40% gasoline in the drip torch and you know these are available various places, easy to get, but this is one of those pieces of equipment that, yeah, you, you need this as an important tool with regard to uh, managing land to the highest efficiency and effectiveness for deer and, and other species. 
This switch grass likely will burn because of the amount of dead fuel that is at the bottom. So that's what I'm expecting. We have water right here with us, and so we'll do a small area to see how it behaves initially. What I expect is that it's gonna burn, all of the leaf material is not gonna burn up, but it'll burn through there, it's gonna pop and crack, and it's gonna be very smoky. That's what happens when you burn during the growing season because you're uh, evaporating all of the water that is, that's in these green leaves. You can see the fire where the wind is coming, pushing it in, and as it's creeping back this way, so this is a backing fire as it backs into the wind. The other end of this now is a head fire where the wind is pushing it into the vegetation. So in a situation, if you had oak trees and you wanted low intensity, it's totally fine to do that. Like this, we don't want to be here all day. So once he has this black line all the way in, then we'll go on the other side of it, put in a fire that the wind can blow very quickly and consume all the way in. Because I thought the switchgrass would burn and it was burning pretty well, I went ahead and got on the upper side of it which is on the downwind side of the switchgrass and lit all the way up through there. So now it's slowly backing into the switchgrass rather than rushing up into it. And what you will find is that you will actually get better consumption of the fuels at ground level by allowing the fire to back because there's longer what we call residence time of the fire on every you know, like square foot of, of area. If you wanted to speed this up, you can do that in a couple of ways. One is you could use a strip heading fire. So that is a backing fire, and that is the fire line, the flaming front. Now, for a strip heading fire, you can burn strips of heading fire up to the receding backing fire. and you can see how much more intensive it is. One thing you can say from here on out, when somebody tells you we can't use fire in Pennsylvania, you can answer them with two words, bull. <laughs> <laughs>